<coughs> okay, so good morning everybody. Thanks for coming uh, to our uh, public lecture. Um, so our speaker, uh, uh, Wei Shang is known to some of you, um, as he did two of his degrees here. He did a first an MA in computer system translation, and then he did an MPhil with us before going on to uh, Dublin City University to do his PhD that he's just finished. And he's now a postdoctoral fellow at Kent State University. Uh, and today he'll be talking on entropy, surprisal, and the horizontality of translation. So, let's yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor St. Andre, for the introduction. Um, so, as you can see in the title, what I'm talking about will be uh, something related to a highly abstract concept called entropy. Um, uh, it may sound uh, a bit difficult to comprehend at the beginning, but uh, if we focus on the probabilistic nature of the mathematical expressions, uh, we might realize that the idea behind it is actually fairly simple. So that's what I'm going to talk about, and I will briefly explain how entropy can describe the process of translation, and at the same time uh, quantify the cognitive load therein. Uh, it'll involve some theoretical discussion concerning the assumed mental states and some also uh, data-driven analysis from an empirical perspective uh, based on a publicly available data set. So uh, this is a, a part of a larger project that addresses the lexical and structural ambiguity aiming to track the influence of linguistic variables on the effort of translation and post-editing but more importantly, also to conceptually understand the cognitive process underlying the observed behavior. What I'm talking about today would be on a lexical level, and this talk will be divided into two parts, right? The discussion on entropy and translation, which involves both theoretical assumptions about the assumed mental states, and entropy as a description of those mental states, and transition between mental states, as well as empirical observations on uh, the expenditure of extra processing effort and how that effort is expended uh, basically on eye movement data, the visual search for contextual clues to resolve a problem associated with a high entropy item. And then, uh, now this theoretical discussion would involve some analysis on how entropy can quantify cognitive load. And then I will move on to a more specific discussion on ways of quantifying this uh, by Two perspectives, from two perspectives. One is shipping resource allocation and the other is production. We we'll just briefly touched upon in a paper uh, two years ago. Um, and to practically operationalize these ideas, we have two metrics, one called ITRA and another is HTRA in uh, that database that I mentioned. Right? And I will try to argue that this shift of resource allocation is equivalent to surprisal and can be approximated by ITRA and that can be approximated by HTRA. After all these, I will analyze the data right, uh, from a statistical uh, perspective and compare these two metrics in terms of their prediction of effort. So that's the structure uh, of the, today's talk. And I hope I will uh, be punctual and finish all these on time. <laughs> okay, um, but uh, to put it in a larger context, we might uh, see all these in view of the predicted term, um, which is proposed by the authors here in 2019. Uh, when translation studies was, was argued to be an independent discipline in its own right, it, it was argued that there would be two main objectives of inquiry, right? One, to describe the phenomena of translation and translating as they manifest themselves in our experience of the world. And two, to establish general principles by means of which these observed phenomena can be explained and predicted. Right? And that has inspired a lot of descriptive studies, uh, uh, especially when corpus-based methods were developed. Right? We, have the, we have some very prolific uh, studies generating hypotheses based on the corpus or the text. But drawing inferences on the process from the corpus is a bit difficult. Right? And finding a cognitive explanation on whatever we see in the patterns in the text is also not easy. But fortunately, recent years also uh, we're also seeing process-oriented research uh, gaining momentum, and this is largely due to the technological advancement. 
and digital methods and rigorous statistical means and methods that are borrowed in other disciplines like psychology, neuroscience, and so forth. Right? Eye moving, uh, sorry, eye movement is one of that you know, borrowed from there. So with all these methods, we're understanding the process in a deeper sense, and our explanation and prediction can be no longer that speculative. We can practically predict translation uh, by more dependable means. And this is why the authors here uh, argue that uh, this seems to be triggering a predictive term. So we're going beyond description and moving on to explanation and prediction uh, uh, in a more reliable sense. This is largely due to two aspects. The machine learning approach to translation, typically represented by neural machine translation systems. And um, if, you, if you follow the news on chat GPT, you know how powerful it, 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 it is becoming. Right? And another aspect of it is on translation process research. We now have all those experimental methods, the statistical means and computational models to more comprehensively and powerfully model the human translation process. So uh, we're understanding the human mind uh, a lot better uh, these days. Now, this is why the, these authors say that there is a predictive term which, uh, as they say, is a new paradigm in translation studies. In view of these terms, uh, not surprisingly, we're seeing a lot of studies that analyze text features that predict the efficiency and cognitive load or effort of translation, as well as other modes of translation production. One of the aspects uh, is the number of translation alternatives in association with particular source text items. If one word can be translated into different options. Um, we see that the IP span, uh, which means the time interval between the first fixation on a word and the start of it production for its translation, this time interval uh, is shown to receive an impact, statistically significant impact, from the number of translation alternatives. This is consistent with studies of ambiguity in psycholinguistics using decontextualized single words. And in psycholinguistics, there seems to be a general consensus that bilinguals activate both of their languages when they're working on either one. And when it comes to multiple meanings, all these meanings are activated subliminally and very quickly at the beginning, followed by a selection process uh, in which these activated items and meanings come into competition for selection. Uh, this is also the basis on which entropy can be used to describe uh, the translation process because entropy as a statistical metric can uh, quantify the activated items. Now, this is what I will be talking about today. One such metric based on entropy is called word translation entropy, uh, abbreviated by extra. I'll be using extra a lot in the following part of the talk. Right? Mathematically, entropy models the degree of uncertainty in a selection. Uh, and uh, note that this uncertainty is used in a probabilistic sense, meaning uh, being certain entails a probability of one, whereas all the other outcomes have a probability of zero, so that we know for certain that the outcome will be that type. Uh, rather than, now wh when it comes to uncertainty, I, I tend to be very careful because the, uh, the, there would be psychological connotations, why, right? I'm not really talking about the cognitive state of indecision that is consciously experienced by uh, an individual, but a probabilistic sense of uncertainty in terms of the outcome of a stochastic or random variable. Um, this metric has been considered a better measure for the variation of the translation alternatives than simply counting how many alternatives there are. From a cognitive perspective, it represents the co-activated translation options that are um, in the mind of the translator. Empirical studies have shown that um, there is a significant impact on different measures of effort using eye tracking methods. One study is Sheffer et al. I'll, I'll come back to later on. Uh, among these aspects of effort, first fixation duration uh, is the first time the eye, uh, the eye is fixated on a particular point. That duration is longer for words with a high extra value. What's important with, uh, with this aspect in comparison with all the others is that the first fixation duration uh, indicates early cognitive processes. So 
the authors of this paper also argues for a horizontal perspective of translation, um, uh, emphasizing the early priming processes, because this product-based metric has an impact on the early cognitive processes when source text comprehension has not finished yet. The target language-related processes are already coming into play. So source text comprehension and target text reformulation processes can happen at the same time. It can happen very, very early on, which supports a parallel processing perspective, and that is in line with horizontal translation, which I'll explain later. Right. And the other aspect of effort is also shown to receive uh, this impact. In very short terms, a higher age of value is understood to be more difficult to translate. So that can also be used as a, uh, as a quantification of difficulty in translation. For most of such studies, entropy or age uh, is consistently used as a measure of the product rather than as a representation of a specific aspect of the mental states during the process. Nor is it considered a, an indication of the transition between one mental state and another. Uh, this is something I will do in this talk. An exception, however, in the literature is the systems theory perspective by Carl et al. Uh, from that perspective, uh, translation is considered as a hierarchy of interacting word and phrase translation systems. And entropy uh, was defined in this way as the internal disorder of the system. So a higher entropy means uh, a, a higher level of disorder, or uh, essentially the fact that the this, this system is disorganized. Uh, this expenditure of effort, as they call it, uh, is considered to be the average energy. Um, which reduces this disorder and organize the system. Now, that would be a very different perspective, right? And, and a very sophisticated and abstract uh, way of looking at that. My perspective would be something different, but we come to the same conclusion. Uh, entropy can describe the mental process of translation selection, and entropy reduction can quantify that process. Uh, from the initial activation stage to the eventual selection, entropy is gradually reduced. And how much is reduced in that entropy would be uh, a possible quantification of the effort involved. So my perspective is, uh, has focused on the probabilistic nature of entropy, as I mentioned at the beginning, as well as the dynamic change of probability distribution in the mental states. Um, as mathematically, it models the uncertainty of choice um, I will draw inferences from psycholinguistics to add to that point and look at the cognitive resource allocation in the activation, suppression, competition, and selection of candidates. Multiple options are available. Uh, this is, um, uh, I, I will use a reformulation of processing difficulty uh, called resource allocation processing difficulty. Uh, and empirically, uh, I'll also look at the specific processes in which entropy is reduced through the transition of mental states, as well as the behavioral manifestation of it. So, the first part, entropy, right? Um, I will explore the conceptual basis on which entropy can describe the cognitive processes, as well as to represent cognitive load in translation. Uh, the, I, the, the notion of entropy here you can see a mathematical equation which, which can be quite daunting, right? But uh, um, this notion of entropy is largely relevant to information theory. Uh, entropy is used in many disciplines, and they might mean different things, but my perspective is from information theory, which is pretty old, in 1940s, right? Uh, in Shannon's mathematical theory of communication, entropy is simply defined as uh, this equation. Uh, it represents uncertainty, surprisal, and freedom of choice. And this value would be maximum if all these probabilities are equal. Now note that this is the sum of different pro probabilities rather than one single element. If a statistic, if a source of message generates a statistic, uh, sorry, stochastic variable that can take different values, say x1, x2, xi until xn, then the information for this message can be quantified by this formula added up in relation to every x, every xi, 
Now, that's the basic idea. For Shannon, this is the expectation of minimum amount of bits required for encoding. Quite a technical term, but it's so influential that we're seeing the application of entropy or Shannon information perspective in many, many disciplines, including language and communication. Shannon's definition of information in McKay's perspective of information and meaning is simply the selectional information content, where the focus of, where the main interest is on the relative improbability of a message, given an ensemble of messages. Uh, this reflects the intuition that unpredicted items should carry a lot of information, whereas predicted items should not. Um, and the term information measures the uncertainty involved in estimating the value. These two perspectives, uh, I, will, I, will, I will apply these two perspectives in the translation context. So when we use it to describe the translation process, we can consider translation as a chain of decision-making activities. The translator con constantly had to make different kinds of uh, decisions. Right? And then the more the de decisions to make, and the more options in that decision, the more difficult it will be. If that decision is straightforward, we don't really have to spend as much effort. Now, that's the idea. So uh, in the same way, as I mentioned on this slide, relative improbability, right? Um, this can, entropy in translation can, can be the relative improbability of a translation option for a particular ST item, given an ensemble of translation options. Suppose we're translating this sentence. Given one word, we would have a lot of choices, right? And, and given all the uh, uh, translation options for the word in question, we would have to make a choice. We would have to make a selection, right? That would be part of the process. And we have to do the same along the sentence again and again and again, and that incurs effort. Uh, different, different words, different entropy values would correspond to different levels of effort. A high information entropy indicates much uncertainty, which when used to describe the translation process, represent a set of co-activated translation possibilities that are equally good choices for the translation of a source text item. Um, for Bangalore et al., uh, this is a better uh, reflection of the cognitive environment, simply because it incorporates the weight of these alternatives rather than simply counting them. Uh, specifically, for HTRA, um, now this is the equation, the same equation I showed. If we have the, uh, say, if we're translating a particular ST item and have multiple choices for this item, uh, ranging from XI to XN, we can use the same way to, to calculate the entropy in relation to the translation choices for that source text item. So we get the probability, convert it to logarithm, and then multiply it by probability, and then add, add up all the, uh, the possible choices. That's the word translation entropy. It describes the degree of uncertainty regarding which lexical TT items are chosen given the sample of alternative translations for a single ST word. Um, to put it in very, very simple terms, um, this has to do with the distribution of probabilities. If all options are distributed equally over a large amount of items, if all these options are equally probable, then the entropy will be high and there will be a lot of uncertainty involved in making that choice. On the other hand, if all these options, if the probabilities are concentrated on one or very, very few items, that means that choice will be very straightforward. And if we calculate this entropy, that value will be very low and that will involve low uncertainty. In other words, the certainty is high. So that's the basic idea. Uh, I will use this perspective in the discussion later on. Indicate, now, given this definition and the empirical studies I mentioned, it's easy to hypothesize that entropy, some aspects of entropy, can be an indicator of cognitive load in translation. And in fact, this is not something new in psycho psycholinguistic studies. Uh, the use of Shannon's formulation has in fact been very, very long using surprisal and relative entropy. The surprisal, mathematically, is defined as the logarith negative logarithm of probability. Now again, it's a probabilistic perspective. Uh, Hale uh, suggests uh, using surprisal of a word uh, in this context to quantify the cognitive effort in processing that word along the sentence. Simply because, from that perspective, 
sentence comprehension is a step-by-step -step disconfirmation of possible phrase structural analyses. And the cognitive load can be understood as the combined difficulty of disconfirming all disconfirmable structures at a, at a given word. Similarly, in the expectation-based models of comprehension, processing difficulty or measurable disruption in behavioral observation uh, arises when there is a sufficiently unexpected input, which causes a shift of, of, of cognitive resource allocation in various, to various alternatives in the face of uncertainty. And the size of this shift, according to Levy, is the change of probability distribution over possible interpretations before and after this word uh, is processed. So the change of probability. Now, I mentioned entropy representing the probability distribution, right? But the change of probability distribution would be relative entropy, right? The entropy of a later stage and the entropy of, a, of an earlier stage. So that's the, that can be quantified um, by relative entropy. And mathematically, it's also called kubeck leibniz divergence. And that, that's a quantification of cognitive relativity. Um, again, in the context of translation, um, we can assume that upon encounter of a particular source text item, possible translations are subliminally co-activated very early on. And a higher entropy value corresponds to a higher uncertainty level, uh, which might be uh, because of a larger number of alternatives or because of the lack of highly likely choices. Right? This has to do with a number of alternatives. This has to do with the probability distributions. Um, in many models of the mental lexicon, this activation is directly affected by context, uh, uh, just as this model suggests. And in another model called reordered access model of the mental lexicon, the, uh, the meanings and items are not activated at the same time. Some are activated earlier, some later. And the relative time course of these activation are related to relative frequency of occurrence. And that means we can approximate this through the text by corpus based means, right? Um, in other models, uh, this activation has a, a combination of enhancement and suppression where the uh, context relevant information is enhanced and the context irrelevant information would be suppressed. Now, there, is, there does not seem to be a consensus as to how context influences this activation. But what we can see from there is that context does have this impact on activation. And that would be enough for our uh, understanding of entropy. So in translation, um, in terms of the probabilities observed in the text, um, this results in a distribution of translation choices, which corresponds to a probability distribution right, in the text, in the corpus of text, rather than in the mind. Um, this distribution represents the fact that not all these um, uh, options are equally probable, or they are not uh, equally appropriate for the context. Right? Some items are more appropriate, some items are not. As a feature of the product, this, the entropy represents the level of uncertainty in the selection in the sample. Now this is the text. Right? When we move on to the mind, we can uh, assume that the translator engages in an activation pattern where uh, these activations receive different degrees of priority for resource allocation. And, or if we adopt a reordered access model, these activations would be in a certain order in terms of relative time. And that would be affected by context, as I mentioned. Uh, this can appear as a distribution of probabilities which are observed in the produced translation in the corpus of text. But in the mind, this uh, distribution represents the mental state at that stage and, and would be subsequently and dynamically updated to arrive at a translation choice as the translator evaluates these activated items. Um, some options will not be as probable. Some options will be more probable. So this probability will change dynamically. And gradually, uh, the distribution of probabilities will be concentrated on fewer and fewer items until there's only one single option. And that will be the option selected eventually. So that's the idea. And in this process, the entropy level will be gradually reduced. Uh, the probabilities are updated accordingly. So entropy, in that sense, uh, refers to the activation pattern in a mental state, uh, the distribution of 
cognitive resource allocation or the distribution of temporary probabilities with which a particular item is going to be selected in the eventual uh, selection stage. Again, entropy represents the uncertainty level in the mental state. Um, in terms of behavioral observation, and this was something more, more interesting than the purely theoretical discussion. <laughs> in terms of eye movement, if we have this sentence, increase in cost of living, that's the previous sentence. British families have to cough up an extra 31,000 pounds a year, where cough up is used in its metaphorical sense, right? Uh, what we observe in the data is that uh, the translator seems to be having, uh, well, tends to have some disruption of processing when it comes to cough up. The production of translation tends to have a pause there, and then the eye movement shows the pattern. This is the eye movement path. Um, this is, the, these numbers are the ID tokens here. So what we see is that by the time the translators proceed to cough up, the eyes move back to two, and then to cough, and then stay there, that's there, for a while, and then move back to families, and then back to in, and then stay there, and then back to increase. It is at this point that the translator will move on, the translating call up, right? All these words will help to contextualize the metaphorical phrase there, and help, it, and help the selection of, a, of an appropriate translation of that, because uh, it's, metaphor. it's not really uh, the normal sense of coffee, right? What's really interesting here is that when we look at the entropy values for all these words, we see that the word cough has a high level of entropy. It's the highest in this data path. All the other words correspond to much lower levels of entropy. This means the high entropy word resulted in disruption of processing or an increased level of effort. And the uh, problem solving in that pro process is facilitated by low entropy items. And overall, the uh, the general entropy level for the entire thing is decreased to a lower level, right? Uh, we, we seem to find that as a pattern for many, many participants. So in terms of statistics, uh, I use the CREEP data set, which is publicly available. If you're interested, you can just Google that and use their data uh, to find some very, very interesting uh, phenomena there. Call up. Uh, I selected a number of studies. That's 10 studies there, uh, in, including 200 something participants. And the translation was from the same English source text to multiple languages. And we find the same pattern for multiple languages and for multiple modes of translation production post editing, translation, interpreting, you know, for different kinds of kind. Uh, we find that there is a pause in production and a regression of eye movement. Regression meaning the eyes will move back, right, as in the previous example. Like we proceed to cough and then move back as a regression, an indication of extra processing effort. And in the scrutinizing of the ST during this course, it tends to involve a visual search for low entropy words, right, as I showed. Uh, this red line here is the entropy level of cough, and this line is density distribution for the entire gate path. And um, we see that the peak and most of these values are lower than the entropy here, and it's consistent uh, in all, across all the studies here. Altogether, this results in a decrease of average entropy. Activity unit is just a, uh, an empirical construct that reflects a cognitive uh, definition of translation unit. Um, that's used in a Crete database, if you're interested. All right, so um, this gaze path means that the word call up has something that results in a problem solving process. And that process leads to that kind of eye movement pattern. In order to uh, search for additional information for clarification, and therefore we observe gaze on other words, uh, other neighboring words, right? Uh, we see that the uncertainty involved in the high entropy word effectively directs the translator to those aspects of the context which are relevant to integrating newly activated information into what has already been activated, enhancing or suppressing certain activation, reducing the uncertainty level in the mind, and uh, facilitates the arrival at a selection in the end. 
Low entropy is a very interesting thing. Now, we can intuitively infer all these aspects, right? Whatever entropy level there would be. Whenever there's a problem, we always look at the context, right? Though that's not surprising. But for low entropy words, for all these words being low entropy items, what can we see from there? Now, I interpret it uh, in terms of the horizontal versus vertical translation, which is a subject of debate in uh, cognitive uh, translation studies. Now, I'm talking about a phrasal verb here, right? Which is pretty interesting. Now, side explains that this is highly idiomatic, and it tells a story. As a child, if I choked on my food, my father would thumb me on the back and cheerfully cry, hold it up, then maybe half a dollar. That's what he described as the origin of this phrase. And, it, and, and, and this author says that without the frame described by side, it's almost impossible to understand. And the question is, in the behavior pattern we saw previously, is the translator invoking this frame, right? Or uh, is it more about source text comprehension at a deep conceptual level? Or is it simply a code switching to the target without this conceptual mediation? That has to do with the notion of horizontal translation. Um, cognitive perspectives tend to divide the translation strategy into two kinds, right? vertical and horizontal. A vertical process is conceptually mediated following a sequential process where the ST message is decoded and then conceptual representation is activated and then the T target language lexical representation is activated. So it's going in a sequential manner. Horizontal translation, however, is very different. It's a direct online and memory-based search for links between linguistic entities and two languages without conceptual mediation. So it goes directly at the surface to another surface. And experimental studies have uh, provided some evidence for the existence of horizontal translation. Even if the strategy is largely vertical, there is also there's still some element, some extent of horizontal translation there involved. So at least we can see that both are uh, involved in the cognitive processes. The difference between horizontal and vertical also sheds a lot of it's also relevant to sequential versus parallel processing in terms of the general processing strategies and information processing. A vertical pr perspective um, would, would argue that the ST reading is distinct from reformulation frames because they're separate stages. Whereas horizontal translation would argue that reformulation in a TL already commences during ST comprehension. So by the time we read the source, the target is already in the mind. Right, without all these complicated process concepts. Um, what, what I want to mention here is that entropy uh, in this paper is used to provide evidence for horizontal translation because by definition, entropy uh, reflects target language related processes. And as I mentioned, uh, it impacts the early processing aspects cognitively. If it comes to into play at a very, very early stage. That means the TL-related processes is already functioning when the translator is reading the source. So that supports a horizontal perspective. Now, what we saw in the gate pattern regarding call for up might be another evidence, another kind of evidence for horizontal translation, simply because these words correspond to low entropy level. As I said, a low entropy uh, level indicates it's easier to activate the target text items, right? The choice is more straightforward. The probabilities are concentrated, so it's easier to activate the target language uh, related processes. Now, we can probably see all these fixations on, word, on these low entropy words as a visual search for the easily activated TL items, or at least that would be the consequence of it by fixating on these words. Those aspects of TL items will come into the mind. And altogether, these words provide a TT code text that will facilitate the choice of an appropriate translation for KOF or KOF up. And from that perspective, uh, perhaps this is not a process that uh, is based on conceptual understanding or uh, uh, or mental representation at a deeper level, but a direct uh, memory-based search for target text items. <laughs>
But, but again, um, we need more evidence. If we really want to claim this, uh, what I'm trying to say is that this is an idea uh, as to how we can use entropy. We might use that as an evidence right, for uh, horizontal translation. Second, quantifying cognitive load. I already touched upon the topic of uh, entropy being an indicator of cognitive load, drawing inferences from psychoanalysis. Uh, as I said, entropy represents the co-activation of both the source and the target. Uh, we can assume that the translator engaged in an activation pattern where these activated items receive different degrees of priority for cognitive resource allocation. Or, if we adopt a different mental model, uh, these activations are in an order, in a certain order, in terms of relative, relative time course. And this activation will be dynamically updated in the selection process, uh, which comes with a continual shift of cognitive resource allocation. So initially, the translator might consider a certain option as more probable, but after proposing and evaluating all these options, uh, another option becomes more probable, and this will become a, a, a lower level of probability. So that, that's a, uh, the cognitive resource will be allocated differently, right? and there will be a continual shift. The size of this shift of resource allocation, as I mentioned, can be quantified by relative entropy, by the difference in probability distributions. Or the re entropy reduction, because this is a process where the entropy level is gradually decreased. And that means we would have two ways of quantifying it shift of resource allocation measured by relative entropy between these two distributions, or the reduction of entropy from the initial mental state to the final mental state, where entropy is gradually increased. Right? If we calculate the entropy here and the entropy there and get the reduction, that might quantify the cognitive level. Right? Or alternatively, we can just look at the probability distribution and get the relative entropy there. So we will have, we will have two ways. And shift of resource allocation uh, is represented by relative entropy. And I will argue here that this relative entropy is equal to the surprise of the item eventually selected. In, in terms of operationalization, that can be approximated from the text to a corpus by means by what we call word translation information or ITRAN. Reduction of entropy is the absolute difference of entropy values between these two mental states. And I will argue that this can be approximated by H, I'm sorry, that's H right there, by H. Now, uh, some more mathematics. Um, if we say that there is the Px distribution in the initial mental state and Qx in the final state, and if we assume that there are n items in the mental lexicon, among which it is word W eventually being selected, then we can do some exciting mathematics. And calculate the relative entropy. Um, <laughs> this is the Kruback Lazar divergence or relative entropy. And if we go along the uh, equation and calculate and add up from 1 to n and then take out w and all the rest. Now, I'm not really going into the details, but what I'm trying to say is that this equation will eventually come down to three parts here, here, and here. And if we do further mathematics, we will realize that this equals 0, that equals 0. So the <laughs> Could that lateral divergence between these two distributions will be equal to the log logarithm of the probability of work done. And that means relative entropy equals surprising. Right? Um, in the same way, if we calculate the other perspective, decrease of entropy, that would be the absolute difference between the initial, the initial mental state, the initial entropy and the final entropy. And uh, again, for the mathematics, which would, would reveal that this would equal to zero. So uh, if we do the um, H0 minus H1, it will simply be H0, which is just the entropy in the initial mental state. Right? This is exactly the same as the equation I showed before about entropy. So shift of resource allocation is represented by relative entropy as formulated by Levy in psycholinguistics. And I have shown that this mathematically is equal to the surprisal of the item eventually being chosen. And in the data, we can approximate that through the test right, by a metric called ITRA. And this is also included in the publicly available data set I mentioned, uh, the Crete 
transaction process research database. The other perspective, reduction of entropy, is the absolute difference of the entropy values regarding two metal stacks. And I have shown that this mathematically equals the ent entropy generalizing over all uh, alternative options and uh, can be approximated from the text by H. Right? Both can be approximated by the text. And in this way, we're also combining process-oriented and product-oriented uh, research together, right? because corpus-based methods is, um, in general, we can find the textual patterns, but it might be difficult to explain uh, why these patterns are there. Right? But using a process-oriented perspective, we might shed more light on um, the cognitive explanation of uh, the corpus observations. Uh, but here, let's focus on the quantification of cognitive load, sim simply from a process perspective. So two metrics are worthy of further discussion, and it's very interesting, H-tra and i -tra. Let's compare them. In terms of the translation product, h which is entropy, generalizes over all translation options. As you can see in the equation, it's a sum of all these items whereas ITRA indicates the unpredictability of a specific item only. In terms of the transaction process, ITRA is the reduction of entropy, and ITRA is the size of shift in cognitive resource allocation. Um, in terms of the mathematical equation, ITRA is the initial PX distribution, whereas ITRA is the surprise of the final choice, and ITRA is the absolute difference of entropy values between the two mental states, whereas ITRA is the relative entropy final sex with respect to the initial state. Which one is a better prediction? That would be a very, very interesting question, right? So more exciting statistics would involve, um, what would shed light on that. Now, in terms of prediction of effort, again, I use the Crete Translation Process Research Database, which is very, very large, and publicly available, very handy, if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, there's a data set called Multiling. Multiling, as you can see from the name, it's multilingual. Uh, all the data sets are from the same source text in English, translated in different languages. And it involves different modes of translation production. I chose 500 sessions, which is very, very large. It involves six studies. These are the uh, names of these data sets. Um, to quantify efforts, I use the eye tracking data, as well as the keystroke data, uh, measured by three aspects. Oh, yeah, three aspects. In terms of the production time, uh, which is indicated by Dewar in the data set, is the duration of the TT production for each ST token. In other words, how long does it take for the translator to translate a particular word? That's the time. Reading time is the first, uh, can be indicated by both the early measures and late measures. The early measures, as I mentioned, uh, indicates the early cognitive processes. It's the first fixation duration. How long is the first fixation on the word. How long does the eye uh, does the eye stay on that word for the first time? First pass duration on the source, first pass duration on the target. Now, all these are on the word level rather than the time it takes for the entire task. So the eye tracker is pretty exciting. You know, it can come down to that level of detail. These are early measures and late measures are total reading time. Total reading time again on the word level. In other words, how long does the translator uh, stay on a particular word in total. Uh, he might, you know, a translator might fixate here and then go here and then move on and then come back, right? The first time will come into the first time, first fixation duration, whereas the total will count all the fixations on the word, uh, regardless of whether it's the first time or a regression. Or whatever, yeah. This will shed light on the late cognitive processes. Now, these are the, in, the dependent variables, and the independent variables are, of course, these two metrics. I was trying to see which one predicts these values better. Uh, multiple regression analysis, linear regression. Uh, it's, it's very simple linear regression, uh, so you know, we might elaborate on it and use more sophisticated models like linear mixed effects model, or we might add you know, more elements. But here, just for illustration purposes, I use a simple regression linear. VRF scores indicates how, you know, whether these, statistically it's called collinearity, which is a precondition for using uh, regression analysis, and the VRF score seems to be okay. Uh, 
So, I used, again, I'm, I'm comparing two metrics. I used each metric to run a linear regression model and see whether this metric predicts all those measures of effort and whether that predicts those. Those are the base models. And then I add both metrics into the linear regression model, and that's the full model. So the base model for HTRA is significant and strong, and for ITRA also significant and strong. But the difference is that ITRA seems to explain an additional 2% uh, of the variance in the, uh, uh, the response variable, which seems to be, which seems to indicate that ITRA is a better predictor. Right? This is consistent with what I will show later on. In the full model, it's also consistent. But if we look at the specific uh, coefficients, we see that ITRA is more than three times as a strong predictor than HTRA for production time. With ITRA control, no additional variance was explained by HTRA, which also indicates that ITRA has a more uh, predictive power. In contrast, after controlling HTRA, ITRA explains an additional an additional 2% of variance. Again, IATRA has a unique contribution to the model, right? It, it, it also, uh, it might indicate that this is a better predictor for production time. So while controlling for the other variable, IATRA made an additional contribution in explaining the variance in production time, whereas IATRA did not. That's production time. It seems to lend support to shift of resource allocation, right? Because we see that IATRA may be a better predictor for our production time. However, if we look at the other aspects of efforts, we see a different picture. For ST reading time, the early measures of ST reading time, and the late measures, all, again, all impacts on all, in all models are significant. Uh, but for both early and late measures, age drug seems to be a much stronger predictor, which is the opposite from the previous observation, right? We see that for uh, first time, first fixation duration, age trait is more than three times <coughs> as strong as I drug. Three times as stronger. Yeah, three times. Uh, for this, it's more than four times. For this, it's more than twice. Right? Consistently, age trait is a better predictor for ST reading time. For TT reading time, again, um, we see that all models are significant. Now we look at the star here, three stars means it's a small. The p-value is very small, so the models are significant. But we don't see a large difference between these two in the strength of prediction. Although they're significant, um, they're equally strong. Um, for, for the strength of prediction, we look at these numbers. Now, this is the base model for h truck That's the base model for i truck This is the full model for first pass duration on the target. Uh, 125, 96, about 100. Right? These values are not really different from each other. So uh, these are called bank values statistically. So for TT reading, we don't see um, that much of a big difference as the previous one. Um, in summary, I looked at these, way, these two ways of quantifying cognitive loads. Theoretical justification is the psycho implicit formulation of of resource allocation processing difficulty. One is the shift of resource allocation, and another is purely from a perspective of entropy reduction. At a conceptual level, HTRA indicates the reduction of entropy in the method set. ITRA is the size of shift in cognitive resource allocation, and then uh, hopefully I provided some theoretical justifications for both ITRA and HTRA as potential means of quantifying cognitive load. And by the way, these are approximated from the text, not from the item print data. So we can use the corpus to approximate these values and then see whether that correlates with the behavior of data. Empirical analyses suggest that both metrics are significant and strong in predicting cognitive effort. But ITRA seems to be a stronger predictor for word production time. And HTRA is a strong predictor for ST reading time. Uh, for TT reading, the difference was found to be relatively small. Um, somehow I don't find this surprising because, as I said, age truck um, has, has been shown to impact the early cognitive processes. And by definition, age truck is the initial probability distribution at the activation stage. And that means the impact of age truck may 
the anxiety early on. That's why we see H2 as a strong predictor for ST reading time. And the word production time presumably would have to do with a lot more processes that would occur later. Right? Production of the TT, choosing an appropriate one, revising it, and you know, re-evaluating whether this is appropriate in the context and so forth. Right? All of these processes that happen at a later stage will be incorporated in the work production time. And that's you know, more related to ITRA, which is simply the description of the final net state uh, as I find it. Right. Um, hopefully, this will uh, contribute to the exploration of dependable, theoretically justifiable, and empirically uh, dependable means of predicting effort. But again, this is a very simple regression model. I haven't considered random effects, right? If we use a more sophisticated, say, linear mixed effects model and add up the, and consider the differences between individuals, the differences between languages, between you know, you know, uh, translation tasks and the way the experiments are conducted and the, the time, you know, you know there, there will be a lot of factors that come into play. Human beings are very complicated. So if we consider all those uh, random effects, we It'll be interesting to see whether we will still find the same thing, right? At the moment, it's a good start, I would say. So, yeah, hopefully, that would be something meaningful. Yeah. Okay, that's my talk today. I look forward to questions. Yes, of course, of course. Um, when, when I was describing the horizontal versus vertical, I seemed to be contrasting them, right? That was the focus of that part. But if we look at the reality, I think the cognitive processes would involve both. It is not either this or that. Nothing at the extreme. Um, I tend to believe that um, every, for each individual, the cognitive processing always involve both. For some people, there might be more horizontality a, 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 you know, a larger extent of horizontality. Uh, for some, it'll be more vertical. And I think when, when it comes to interpreting, uh, we're constrained by time. We have to produce the translation faster than written translation. And that means we need more horizontal processes. Right? If we go down to the conceptual level for every utterance, uh, that will incur a lot of effort and a lot of time, which, is, uh, which, which may not be practical. Uh, so, I would say that part of the interpreting training is to uh, entrench that source-target relationship, that lexical linkage between the SL and the TL uh, as part of the competence development. Um, the entropy, is, you know, specifically HTRA and ITRA, uh, is not confined to which strategy that the translator would use, because basically those metrics are from the text. Given a text, uh, it will correspond to a particular number. Uh, the, 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 other, the, the other side of the coin is that it extrapolates the performance of a group of individuals to a particular individual, because, because for, say, for you and for me, given a sentence, say, thank you, <laughs> um, it'll give the same entropy value for the both of us. But obviously, our cognitive processes will be different, right? So in our mind, the entropy value should be different. But when we approximate it from the text, it will give the same number. Yeah, so from that perspective, regardless of how we process that translation, um, 
the metric would still apply. It is, it is only about the, whether that metric is reliable for describing both of us, right? Um, I think to, if miraculously someone has access to our mental lexicon and use the items in our mental lexicon to calculate those entropy values, that will indicate our mental processes. And that entropy level would be different between us. That is not possible to observe, right? Something in the mind is always a black box. We can only approximate that. And, and in pro approximation, we can't avoid extrapolating that performance from a group upon, uh, you know, to an individual. Uh, but again, that, that, that's a bit long. What I'm trying to say is that, um, yeah, we can. We can use those metrics, regardless of whether you adopt a diagonal, I adopt a horizontal, and maybe James would adopt more of a vertical way of processing. We would have the same number of entropy. And then we can relate that entropy to the measures of effort for the three of us and see if it leads to the consistent result. I would say probably yes. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. would be another independent variable to consider, right? Another factor that would influence the relationship between entropy and cognitive effort. Uh, as I said, that model was very simple, right? I haven't considered even the differences between languages, the differences between experiments and, you know, participants. But if we add them into it, I, I would say that we might see a better correlation when it comes to literature, uh, because the effort would be large. The difference between a more difficult part and an easier part, that difference might be larger compared with those kinds of informative texts, right? Um, yeah, it would be interesting to consider that. And um, it, it I think the only thing we need, if we have that data based on different kinds of text types, the only thing we need uh, is to run through the same procedure and add more independent variables or use a linear mixed effects model and consider those variables as random effects and see um, what the results would be. Yeah, yeah, uh, but that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Yes. In the context of this presentation, it might mean that for a more experienced translator, for a higher level of translation competence, there would be, there might be a larger extent of horizontality, right? Uh, the translator may not spend that much of an effort to search for the context, look for neighboring words, and think about it, and then pause, and then you know, uh, produce the translation. Uh, an experienced translator might immediately produce that, right? And that means. Uh, the visual search for contextual clues would be to a lesser extent. And the <coughs> entropy reduction in the mind uh, is, is 
is, is less. Um, I would say that it might indicate more of a direct and memory-based search for lexical entries in the mental lexicon without resorting to conceptual mediation. Yeah, but in terms of entropy predicting that effort, again, entropy is from the text, right? For everyone, that, that, uh, that entropy number is the same. This, this does not exactly represent the entropy in the mind, but that the only thing we can do, the only thing we can approximate that value is from the text. And when it comes to the text, it'll be the same for everyone. Um, for an, an, an experienced translator, the effort incurred at that point may be less than another translator, but we might see that the effort here might be larger than the effort for the next word for the same translator, if you know what I mean. Right? Uh, suppose I'm very, very experienced with a high level of uh, translation competence. Uh, when I go along the text, there are always some parts that are easier than others, although that difference may not be as large as someone you know, who is not uh, very experienced. But we would still have that difference. So I think in terms of predicting effort through the entropy, we would still see, uh, presumably, we would still see that relationship. This part, higher entropy, higher effort than that part, the effort here is higher than that for the same individual. Again, this will need more sophisticated regression analysis. If I add, a, if, if I add that independent variable into the model, we would see that. If we control the individual, right, and con confine it to only the experienced translators, that model will tell us if we still see that relationship between entropy and, and effort. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks. The, that, that leads to the same thing. More effort and more interesting findings if we use more sophisticated model and more data. Yeah. here in this talk is just to explain, yeah. right? Um, but the studies I mentioned uh, in relation to entropy were simply aiming for prediction from the text. Um, if we have a metric that's um, calculated from the text only without resorting to the behavior and somehow um, see a predictive power for that uh, metric, uh, in relation to the behavioral data. That's prediction, right? Uh, that means, given the text, we would have a bunch of numbers. And these numbers will predict whether more effort would incur to some parts of the text in uh, compared with another part without translating it in the first place, right? Um, if those studies um, adopt rigorous statistical analysis and if their conclusions are dependable and replicable, uh, probably we might be able to predict before translating, right? Because before translating, the only thing we have is a, some words on paper, right? If based on these words on paper, behavior can be predicted, right? That's part of the, the prediction. Does that address the yeah. question? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, can I ask a follow-up? But so then, what exactly are you trying to predict with this model? Uh, effort, effort of, of, of the cognitive effort of translation. And that's interesting because... Um, okay, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you're asking about a use case, right? Can I, can I, can I, can I ask you about the, the implications of the translation that I made based on these kind of models? Mm. Okay, so if we're predicting cognitive load, so even, let's say you could manage to predict the cognitive load of the source text before it's even translated, um, then 
might such models in real world scenarios lead to uh, homogenization of language or translation? Because you might see that oh, this is going to be cognitively too difficult, or it's going to need to increase costs for a translation company, therefore, before we even translate it, we need to simplify the text. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, if we think about the practical, I, um, I think it might help with the translation companies to decide on a uh, payment, right? Because um, we, we might need to know, we, you know what kind of text is difficult, right? And in terms of education, we might also need that. Just to, um, if we have a standard for translation difficulty, um, we would have a better way of, of assessing translation competence, right? Uh, when, when it comes to teaching, if we have a, a, a measure of difficulty uh, that's reliable, uh, we might be able to design a, a, a piece of text that uh, would, would correspond to a certain kind of difficulty level. Um, that, that's what came to my mind when, when you mentioned this, but yeah. It just, it just seems to me that the implications might be that, that entropy is seen as like a bad thing. I know in, and in studies like this, it's not, you know, you're not ascribing any value to it. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in a real world scenario, thinking, oh, entropy, like, that's bad because it involves more time. Um, and that would discourage translators from using more, and spending more time on finding more unusual equivalents, and then you're kind of, you're kind of defaulting to, to, to more standard. Translations. Uh, so, like yeah. for example, in your cough up example, yeah. um, if you translate into Chinese, I mean, I don't know, maybe you that's something very basic. Would be like, you don't, you don't translate the metaphor. It's like full, full tool, right? So you spend, you, you spend extra money, right? Yeah. So you don't, you're not spending the time to actually think about let's do an interesting translation. Yeah. yeah. At least this is what you're Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Um, um, that just reminds me of um, something that's. Um, when we talk about the horizontal and vertical translation, the idea of entropy, some people uh, base that uh, discussion on what they call literal translation hypothesis, which basically says that the translators would adopt the easiest option and the literal option first, and then go along with that, unless there's a problem with that choice. And some say that based on corpus observations, we see that not only in novice translators, but experienced translators as well. They, they, you know, they, they just go for the, uh, uh, in that example, they just go for an easier option rather than I think that much on um, you know, finding a creative kind of version of it. Uh, yeah, just to avoid spending cognitive efforts, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about how you calculate values. Oh. So uh, when you're, when, I mean, so at one point on your slide, suddenly you have all these numbers that you said that, that have been calculated, and you have to back, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yeah, so you, you have these numbers, but then you didn't really say anything about how you yeah. get these. Yeah. Very simply, like what, how do you, how do you get Yeah, a sure, right? It's approximated from the text, and the equation is here. Here. So, where do those numbers come from? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Where do the numbers? How do you assign the value to x? Yeah. Um, so if we have a group of translators, now the extra was approximated in the Crete database uh, from an experimental session. So if we have several uh, translators producing their text, um, for a particular word, we would have different translation versions, right? Each version would correspond to a frequency of occurrence. That frequency can be converted to a probability. That's PXI. For each individual option, we count the frequency and convert to probability, and then convert the probability to logarithm and then calculate uh, according to that formula. We do the same for each option produced by these translators, and then add them up. That would be the number for word translation entropy. So 
one problem with that way of approximation is that um, it's based on the experimental session. In other words, it models how different these people uh, translate differently, uh, rather than directly indicating the cognitive environment of an individual. And it extrapolates the performance of a group of people uh, up, uh, up onto a, a particular individual. So it is not an exact reflection of the, uh, of the cognition for, for an individual. But um, yeah, we, we might have better ways of approximation. Uh, but uh, you know, just to answer that question, these numbers are from um, the translation options in the experiment. Suppose we have word cough right, um, produced by, say, 100 people. Cough 1, cough 2, up until cough 100. Some may choose the same option, and that would uh, correspond to a frequency more than one. Right? We count the number of frequencies, and then divide that number by the total count. That would be the probability. And we convert that probability to the logarithm. That would be the surprisal. And this surprisal times the probability of that option. We do the same for each option we observe, and then add them all up, which will come down to the number of a cough. So that's why how, how it's calculated. So let us take into account, for example, if there may be another option, but nobody in the group selected that right. option, right. that option is not representative. Right, right. That's confined to the experimental session. To be honest, I think it should be better approximated from a corpus, from a uh, well-designed corpus. Right. If it's a well-balanced corpus, it might indicate the general population. If it's a special domain corpus, it might be closer to the cognitive environment of a particular translator working in that area. So it depends on what corpus we use. For that calculation, the corpus is pretty limited because the text used for that calculation was only from the experimental session. Yeah, yeah. But their session is actually pretty large because the database is large. It's just that some translators may not resort to some options that are possible, but not observed in the experiment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so this kind of gets back to the database, but I'm just wondering if um, the paths not taken are something new. <coughs> so the sort of more unusual ones, you have to have a fairly large data set to see purchases of those items. But then they don't, they don't exactly exist, but then right. They also right, 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 right. It is still there. So I would say, I, if I do the same calculation myself, this is just from their data, if I do it myself, I would just use a, a corpus to do it, just to incorporate all the possibilities. Yeah. yeah. And so does that mean that the surprisal for the public word is going to be different for each occurrence in the corpus? So, like, so, for example, there's, one, there's this one particular sentence where you have the phrase pop up, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you've calculated the a value, the h strap for cough in this particular instance. But if cough up occurred somewhere else in the database, hmm. would the h strap for that example of, of cough up be different? Because you would also be calculating it based on the decision by the for that sentence, not the translation yeah. of the sentence. Yeah, well, for this calculation, well, their data gets updated uh, from time to time. So it depends on data processing. Um, you see, each word has an ID number, right? This call, if a call occurs, say, at position 21, mm -hmm. right? Same word, but a different ID number. If we use the ID number to calculate that, that would be different. So it's separate. Yeah, if, if we use the word to calculate, that would be the same. Yeah, uh, for this calculation, um, I, to be honest, I need to refresh my memory. So I don't really, I don't really remember whether it was the ID number or the uh, the token itself because there was some, some time ago. But um, yeah, just a just a short answer. It depends on what we use to process the data. But so in this situation, you do what? You do the individual token. Or you could do yeah, their data. So the data processing can uh, be conducted through two ways. They have a web server 
we can only uh, we can just click the buttons, upload our raw file, and then download their process data. That means we would we will we not know what happens you know, on the server. But they also have scripts to download. We can run that in a local computer, and that means we can you know, control how it's produced. The only problem is that on the server the scripts get updated from time to time. So uh, if we do it now, it might be different if we do it next year, uh, if we use their server. But if we download that script and modify that script uh, according to our use, then uh, it, it would be stable. Yeah. And so when you look at how this value changes depending on where you are in the sentence, so I mean, so like you have a lot of very common words in there. Are they yeah. Do they tend to have similar extra values, or does the extra value vary very widely according to what kind of context it occurs in? Um, you know, I think for this, well, I'm not really sure about this, but somehow I think this is based on the token. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I need to check the, the data set uh, at that time. So that would be one average across the whole data set? Yeah, probably. That's likely. Uh, the individual. If, if cough occurs in another place, these two cough, uh, these two tokens will come into the calculation rather than one for each. So that's what I assume. But again, I'm not really sure I need to shape the data for that. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's a, an important point, right? Because it's directly related to what number we get. And the cough up here may not be the same as cough that occurs in another context. Because it's the individual words about phrases. Right. Yeah, individual words. Yeah. So if somewhere else the word cough appears, but it's in its normal sense of the word, mm. and you're using and this sort of using to the token, mm. then those two will be combined together. And so maybe there's a there's a large amount of effort for this one, mm. but then in the other reference there's a very low effort. But if yeah. they average out and the uh, number would be what will really reflect what's going on here. Right, right, system. right. That will influence this number. Um, for, the, for this calculation, simply because it's a phrasal verb, right? And we're counting the translation in the target language. And that depends on the alignment at the word level, right? Sometimes the translation is for the entire phrase. Yep. Right, yeah. And that means cough and up will come into the calculation for both. And that means the h stroke value for both cough and up will be the same, right? Whenever we count the target tokens, we need to align the source and the token first. And that alignment will also influence what number we have here. Right? If we align only cough, then up would be corresponding to a different value. If we align the whole thing, they will, you know, they will be considered as a group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, it depends on data processing. Uh, if I do the same kind of analysis based on their data, I would definitely download your script and do it myself rather than upload it to a server and then download, you know, and use whatever they produce. And so I guess yeah. I was gonna ask also as a follow up, I mean what do you do with things like Chengyu? What? What do you do with fixed expressions for things like Chengyu? Chengyu, huh? So like if you were translating from Chinese into English, would you treat Chengyu as foreign individual words? Yeah. Or would you treat them as a phrase? I mean, like so how does the how does the how is that decision made? Mo well, the guideline in the Creek database, even the Creek database, or what yeah. I think it should be done. Well, both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, in their database, uh, they want a value for each individual token. So the guideline for alignment in their database uh, is to align at the smallest unit possible. Yes. So if medium can be separated into different components then they will be aligned individually. Uh, but personally, if I really want to do some analysis on the cognitive processes, I tend to believe that they are processed holistically. So uh, aligning them in, in, in their entirety would make more sense to me. Uh, they, their guideline says the smallest unit simply because it's easier to process the data uh, to get a number for each individual token further processing and then combine this language, uh, compare this language with another one right, because that compilation may be different across languages. Yeah, that's, I think that might be their concern about aligning it holistically.
Um, although I do think that if you try to put a simply for one language, a certain group of words might be become a fixed expression, but in another language, it might become different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Different, different bits. And so then you have the problem of language A, this phrase aligns with this, like this word and this word can be aligned, but in language B, this word aligns with two or three words, or so this phrase will align with one word, or this phrase will align with Right. Or something. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 But the calculation of H rays for each individual language, independent. Yeah. Yeah. So this. So the H curve here was for. Um, for. Chinese. Uh, no. No. The. the Chinese because they are Chinese data was not good. And the eye tracking data was not accurate in their Chinese data set. So I didn't really use Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but these analyses were done individually for each study, rather than merging them as a whole. So I did this for this study uh, for a particular language, and then the same thing for another, and the same thing for yeah, and each study there. Other questions? Okay, well then, uh, thank you very much.